I would like to introduce Veronica uh, Lesaputra, who is from the University of Waikato. Uh, she is Ian Witten's student there. She is uh, working under a Google scholarship to study ebook user interfaces, and she's going to present some work that she just presented at the Joint Conference on Digital Libraries. Veronica. Okay. Um, so Thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about my PhD project, which focusing on simulating electronic document using the book metaphor. For today's talk, I'm going to explain about how to turn the pages of an electronic book. So the outline of my talk will be, first, I'm going to explain about the book metaphor, the evolution of the book, user's reading behavior, and techniques to model page turning. Then I will show you my book um, prototype example that uses one of these page turning mechanisms, and I will summarize my talk. So it will be a very short talk. There are actually lots of debate on the use of the book metaphor. Some people believe that it is useful using the book metaphor because people are already familiar and have experience with it. But others believe that it's actually useless using the book metaphor. It actually limits the potentials of an electronic book. It may even lead to a poor design. They believe that it actually doesn't matter how the new representation looks like. Once users are familiar with it, they will no longer rely on the book metaphor. And so they're saying, don't judge a book by its cover, judge it by its content. And those experts believe that's only the text that is important. The visual properties of the document, it doesn't matter at all. However, this is not how um, humans are trained. Our human brain already trained unconsciously to use the visual properties of the documents to tell us about the document's age, usage, and quality. Choosing the right text format is important because it essentially um, tell how the knowledge is organized and presented which in turn affects how you serve uh, reading comprehensions and reading experience. Through the 4,000 years of its history, the document format has gone through a series of changes. The main motivation for this change is to find a format that is economical, portable, and user-friendly. Surprisingly, we can also find the same evolution in the development of the electronic document formats. So the three main document formats are scrolls, concertinas, and the codices. In the scroll format, document is represented in a long files, pages, right? And then user need to use, so if it's um, electronic, then you have web pages, then user have to use the scroll bars to basically roll and unroll document to search for a passage. Another example of the scroll format is the teletype roll paper. The second format is the concertinas. This is the intermediate format between scrolls and codices. It was preferred over scrolls because when it is um, looking from across, okay. So when it is folded, it resembles like a book. You can randomly access any page. An unfolded concertina is essentially a scroll, providing a backward compatibility. An example of this format are the Fanfold printing papers, Adobe Acrobat readers, and Microsoft Word print preview, where users can either use the scroll bars or the page up and down button to go to the next page. A user study shows that for the short documents, users prefer scrolls over the concertina formats because they're already used to um, using scroll long longer than the concertinas. However, for a long documents, users actually do not prefer to use scrolls because they can easily get lost in the flow of information. Just moving the scroll bar slightly can change the screen content completely. That's why they always use page up and down buttons. When the concertina, although it helps the user gain better understanding of the document's logical structures, they still find it hard um, to know where they are on the documents and the length of the documents itself. So that brings me to the last document format, which is the codex format. This is the standard document format. It was preferred over the concertinas because it uses less material, which means that it is cheaper, it's easier to read and store, and it's portable. And recently, many researchers tried to simulate electronic document using the book metaphor. They find that the user gained a better document's um, 
understanding about documents logical structures and also that user already understood the book metaphor so they know exactly what to do without they need to say oh you need to turn the page or something like that adding functionality such as annotation highlighting can increase readers engagement and fulfillment so i guess everyone already seen this video so i'm just going to skip it yeah or do you want to watch it okay sure ja så får du komma vidare så tar du tak i ett ett ark mm. på en måten här och så liksom blar du över på nästa sida så där fortsätter texten där. Jag blar alltså. Du blar ja. Men men när jag ska tillbaka då? Ja, då bara blar du tillbaka en par tak där. Och så är det så. Där, så är du tillbaka till den texten du hade så. Inte någon Okej, så slutar där. Ja. Och så så Okay. <laughs> so as you can see that page turning is the important navigation in a book. A user study done by Catherine Marshall actually shows that page turning is actually a combination of a complex lightweight navigation, as I will show you in this series of photographs. So here we have a girl that reading her favorite magazines, and as you can see that she already anticipating herself to turn the page while she's still reading the first page. And then she partially turned the page, and she said that it's because she want to look ahead the content of the next two pages. She want to get more context of what's happening with the articles. Once she fully turned the page, she, she make the magazine into a double page display. Again, she said that she want to get overview of how long is the article going to go for and about the art, about the context that she is going to read and when she satisfied with that she fold the magazine into a one page spread and then focus herself reading on the left page so while reading users are always anticipating uh, themselves to turn the page the same behavior also can be seen when they're reading an electronic documents or using an electronic book readers they always place their mouse or their scroll bars near the navigational um, buttons or the scroll bars. And although clicking navigational button is effective, user actually briefly lose contact with the text, which means that they cannot suddenly look ahead the content of oh what is the next page while well, they're still reading the first page. They always just have to go to the next page. There's no middle bit. This is why simulating a realistic page turning is important. When we want to simulate a realistic page turning, we always have a trade-off between the accuracy and the speed. If you want our page turning to look as realistic as possible, then it will be uh, complex to compute, which means that it is slow to render. There are two types of simulation, geometric simulations and physical simulations. 
In the geometric simulation, the appearance of the page is defined by a set of mathematical equations, which means that it is simple and fast to compute, but it may not be accurate and it's also uh, restricted. The second simulation is the physical simulation. In this simulation, the appearance of the paper is defined by the material properties of the paper and the forces that we apply to the paper, which means that the simulation is accurate and flexible, but it is complex and slow to compute. When we want to create a realistic page turning, we want to find a model that not only looks sufficiently realistic, but it has also to be scalable to handle large page count and computable in real time. Sorry? What does accurate mean here? It means look realistic, like look like a real book, a real page, sorry. Oops. Okay. So for this talk, I'm going to explain about um, three uh, page turning um, techniques that I have investigated and implemented during six months of my PhD project. The peeling method, particle method, and the finite element method. But before I start explaining about the page turning models that I implemented, I will explain about the British Library Turning the Pages project, because this is the project that inspired me to actually find my own page turning um, techniques. So in the British Library Turning the Pages project, readers sit on a, like, a touch screen display, big touch screen display. And they can basically metaphorically grab the corner of the page and swipe their finger across the display to turn the page. And as you can see, that the bend is looks three-dimensional and the binding move in sympathy to where they are um, when they turn it. And I will show you a video of their promotional reel. But for many years, people have been asking us to see more pages than we can display in the exhibition gallery, more access to those important books. The British Library is committed to a digitization program that will make our collections available to the widest possible audience. And what Windows Vista allows us to do is deliver some of those programs in very creative ways. We're going to make the Turning Pages Toolkit available to libraries throughout the world and they can quite simply put their collections online. Turning Pages seems to appeal to everyone. Um, and we've had positive feedback from people from all over the world saying that this is exactly what the internet should be used for. Okay, so as you can see that Microsoft actually supporting this project at the moment. And the way that the simulation works is actually by taking photographs at each intermediate page turn uh, point. So for example, if you have the book and you want to turn this page, then they take photograph on this, 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 and this. And so essentially what is shown to the user is not the computed model of the book, but it's just a series of images, which means that the turning path is um, predefined. So the cost of creating your book into this turning the pages book, if you have a thick book, then it's 200 US dollars, right? If it's thin book, it's 2,000 US dollars. And you might think that, yeah, that sounds reasonable, thick book, 200 US dollars, but it's actually per page, right? So Microsoft willing to pay about um, 10,000 US dollars for the 500 pages book. So for, for like my presentation, which is 32 pages, then it will cost me 64,000 US dollars, and I don't have much money like Microsoft, so I decided to create my own page turning models. Okay, so the first method is the peeling method. This is the example of the geometric simulation uh, method. In this peeling method, the paper is divided into three sections. The visible part of the page being turned, the green bit, the crease polygon, and the refilled area underneath the page being turned. Because we ignore the translation in the z directions, meaning that the crease polygon is the exact reflection of the refilled polygon. And it can be computed by drawing a line that is perpendicular by sector to the line CP. Because in this method, we actually computed um, the mo uh, model of the book. That means that the turning path is not predefined, which means that I can actually turn the corner to the page like whatever. It's not just one, um, one way, like in the British Library Turning the Pages project. However, because this is a geometric simulation uh, model, that means that for each different type of paper, I have to create a new set of mathematical equations. 
So for flexible paper, we can use peeling. But for a stiff, oops, sorry. How do you right click in this? <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> okay, so basically, it's become not universal. So in this um, simulations, we choose a physical simulations. In the physical simulations, because we take into account the material properties of the paper and the forces that we apply to the paper, this means that it can be used for any type of paper just using one formula. It consists of four major components, the mesh representations, the internal forces, external forces, and the time integrations. So the first method is the particle method. I do. Hold down control. Control? Control, click the same as right click. And then it's this one, control. And then right click. Ah, oh, okay, cool. Yes, so I can show you the stiff one, hang on. <laughs> Sorry. So if it's a stiff paper, then it will look like that, right? So we're using a shearing method instead of the peeling method. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so in the particle method, we divided the papers into n by n particles. That is connected with, oops, with three different types of springs, stretched, spring, shear spring, and the bent springs. For each of this type of spring, we can choose a different spring constant, which means that um, we use the spring constant to stimulate the material properties of the paper. So for example, if you have a normal flexible paper, it's not easily stretched and sheared, but it can be easily bent, then you choose a high uh, spring constant value for the stretch and shear spring, but small constant value for the bend. The second internal force is the damping force. This is the friction force uh, within the deformed material. And the two external, oops. And the two external forces um, that applied to the paper is the gravity force and the user force. And we can calculate the position of the paper at the next time step by using Euler explicit time integrations, which is just a normal Newton's law. However, because we do not want to um, create the pa stimulate page being torn from the book, we have to use a limit straining, which basically says that the paper cannot be stretched or sheared more than 10% of its original length. So if we have two particles, particles I um, and J, and then we basically said that, say if the original length is one, and at the next time step the original length is two, then basically we move both particles closer together, so the length become only 1.1. However, if one of those, oops. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. That's weird. <laughs> it never happened. I think because I use Windows, so sorry. Okay. okay it we is just... a Macintosh, so. <laughs> so basically, um, if, so that's particle I, if it's in fixed um, positions, for example, it's on the spine of the book, then we move um, particle J closer together to particle I. So, oh, you can't see it. Should we just refresh it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I can do it faster. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so. This is how it looks like. So if you can see, there's actually the pink bit, which is actually the force. So this um, simulation, it looks more realistic than the peeling method. However, it's, um, the paper still look rather springy because we use a spring. This is why I use a finite element method. Next one. 
So in this finite element method, the paper is divided into m by n elements. And each of these elements is then divided into three layers. The bottom layer, the middle layer, and the top layers. For each of these elements, we then calculate the internal forces, the external forces, and the time integrations. So the first internal forces is the stress. This is the force that we applied on each patch. It can be calculated by multiplying the deformation matrix with the strain. So strain is just the deformation of the paper. And the deformation metric characterizes the stress-strain relationship. So this metric is the one that defines how the paper should react under a certain forces. It's defined by three constants, the Young modulus of elasticity, the Poisson's ratio, and the shear correction value. So this four bit at the top is basically saying that if you have a paper that is elongated on the x directions, even though just a little bit, then it will be compressed on the y directions. But if you have paper that is compressed on the x direction, then it will be elongated on the y directions. So the strain is actually the spatial derivatives of the point displacement. So instead of calculating every uh, displacement on each point in the element, we define eight reference points so that we can, so we put the eight reference points on the middle layer. And by doing this, we can um, define the position, x, y position of any points in the element relative to this at reference point. Then we define a normal factors uh, of the middle layers at each of these at reference points. So by doing this, we then define the z positions of any points in the element. So Veronica, if you're just using the middle layer, why do you want the middle So we have to use the middle layer because we want the x and y position. And then the thickness is the z. But that's why we use the normal factor. So basically, it's using this formula where the um, w is actually the interpolation functions. And the psi, eta, zeta is basically the x, y, z um, local coordinates in the elements. All right. And because we can write um, the displacement is basically the position of the point at this time step minus the position of the point at the next time step. And because um, we can define the position of any points relative to the positions of the reference points, that means we can write the displacements of any points from the displacements of any reference points. And so we can write the stress is equal to k times um, q, where k is the stiffness matrix and Q is the displacement of the eight reference points. If you see this closely, it actually looks similar to the spring force, only we use um, matrix instead of spring constants. So again, the two internal forces will be stress and damping, and again, we use um, mat damping matrix instead of damping constants, similarly with the external forces. And so basically, using, again, physics law, Internal force equal external force. And by doing this, we can find the um, acceleration using the new mark implicit time integrations. And so this is how it look like. So this one, it look more realistic than the um, particle method. However, this is actually just a video, right? In real time, it actually takes about one hour to do this page turning. Yeah, so it's not realistic to use it in real world, especially in just a normal workstation PC. So this means that out of these four um, page turning model, of course, we can't use the British Library. It's too expensive. The finite element method, it's basically too long. So we have choice between peeling and the particle method. Well, while the peeling method is look not so realistic, it can be done just by using a lightweight programming environment. Like here, I use Flash. It's because um, in peeling, it's just one mathematical equation. Well, in particle method, we have differentiation, integration, which means that we need a stronger programming environment. So we have to use something like Java Applet. And because the goal of making the book prototype is basically to create um, a docu new document representation that load fast so people can view it quickly, then we can't use the particle method. And this is why I choose the peeling method, because I can do it just using Flash instead of Java, Java applet, where users need to install more softwares. So now I will show you my um, book product up, um, example. Do I get internet connection here? 
Internet connection. Oh, internet. Oh, do I don't have it? Yeah, we could try. <laughs> <laughs> Should we just click? Um, okay, it's just say settings. Oops. Okay, just open it. <laughs> this is not working for my Kindle. <laughs> Can I have your app? Yeah. Oops. Okay. Yep, sure. So, what I showed you before was actually taken from my Microsoft, Word, uh, Microsoft PowerPoint presentations, and then I convert them into Flash, so I can have animations and video. But my prototype application also can accept like a PDF file. So if you have one PDF file, you tell me the file name, and actually I will run a script to make it into like a book. So this is an example from the Internet Archive collections, the Robin Hood one. And then the way that this loading works, not only because Flash loads faster than PDF, it's also because the pages that are load is only the pages that users want to see. So in, I don't um, download the, like the whole 1,000 files, it's just four pages at the start. And when user, oops, when user flip again, then that's the other two pages and it's all cache, so you start, don't have to do it again. Yep. And if this works, oops. Yep, then you can zoom in and zoom out as well. Okay. And they can jump into any page. But look, so, sorry. So basically, that. As you can see in here, right, if, it, if you're in a PDF, you can't actually say where you are in documents or how big exactly your documents right away just by looking at it. But in here, you can actually navigate through, you know, using the side um, edges of the book, and you can tell exactly where you are on the documents and how big is your document. So this is an advantage again to the PDF format. And if I go back. It also can accept an HTML file. So if I have one HTML file, actually this is taken from the Greenstone Humanity Development Library. Scott's control. So this is like the HTML files, right? And if I view source, then basically you have the metadata of the section name, and what's the content of the sections. And because I have this, then in my book, I can have this bookmark and create automatic um, table of content of where the sec each subsection and section started. You can jump into a page, of course, and they can go to the bookmark. And if you want to view where all the pictures are, then you just change it snap to pictures, and you know exactly where all the pictures are. So as you can see, that this is really fast. That means like, I can add more functionality to the book without like, any adding um, computational time, because it's all really fast. And if you want to be, say for example, this is my favorite um, example from my supervisor. He said that, Book is really, you know, you can't change a real book from hardcover to softcover, right? So let me change that to softcover, right? <laughs> okay. So this is like the advantage of having digital book, right? So you can do more things that um, normal book can't. Okay. So if you want to play around, that's basically the URL. You can play around with my books. Okay, to summarize, so page turning is an important navigation feature in a book. Although clicking navigational button is effective in digital settings, users actually briefly lose contact with the text, which means that it's become interruptive. This is why simulating a realistic page turning is an important feature. It's not only engaging users to like start um, turning the page and it look pretty as well, but it's actually also allow user to briefly look ahead the content of the next two pages. 
In this talk, I have presented three page learning models, the peeling, particle method, and the finite element method, where the peeling has become the chosen one because it required the lightweight programming environments, and the finite element method is the one that's the most realistic. So my next step of my uh, project is basically to add more functionality to the book, just to make it more usable, like searching, annotations, bookmarking, highlighting, and like Bill said, maybe adding some recommended reading and stuff like that. And then I will evaluate this um, prototype against the conventional representations, which I have to think about more. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. And is there any questions? Yeah, <laughs> good. Yeah, so why is page training important? I mean, you've shown a lot of examples. But you basically argued that it. <laughs> <laughs> Repeat. Um, the, my, my question is really, you, you've argued that page turning is really important, and I'm wondering what's the evidence for that? Uh, so, I mean, we've seen a lot of videos of things, but what's the argument that page turning is a uh, actually important functional part of the book experience? Okay, so I have, the first one is because people actually, when they look at the page turning, they know exactly what to do, unlike scroll. So when I show to users, this is not um, text heavy user, right? They look at my book, they know exactly what to do. They say, oh, I want to turn the book. But if it's in the scroll, they're like a bit confused what to do. And do, you then, have, do you have any evidence for that? Yeah, I have done informal user study. I don't bring it here, but yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and the other thing is also people love options. So for example, if you want to just, you know, efficiently just clicking the next button, you can. So it will just go flip, 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 flip. Or if you want page turning, then you can. It's just another option for users as well. Because it doesn't add those, you know, adding overhead right. on them anyway. So. so I guess what I'm really trying to get at is this is a lot of work for something that may not be crucial for the user experience. That's what I'm trying to get the sense of whether or not it's really important and, and why you believe it's important. Well, well, when I did my initial, you know, informal user study, they actually showed that they want this page turning. So that's why I do it. Yeah. Do you provide a way when you do the page turning? Do you do you a way when you do the page turning to turn multiple pages? I see you turning just like to the next page, but can you turn like pick through a little bit? So at the moment, um, see this is just a prototype, right? So you mean okay. like if you want to go I'm to a flip a few pages, like two or three, and see the content like three pages down. You know, sometimes when you thumb like through the that? corners of a book, you're looking for something. Oh, okay. Yeah, I haven't implemented that functionality yet. Okay. Yeah, but I will. Actually. I was just wondering if you had thought about what the, how the user would do that. You know, how would you distinguish picking the very next page from picking two or three pages down, sort yeah. of in terms so, of the UI? Yeah, okay. So basically, at the moment, I use yours like that. If the pages is about like 10, Five mm -hmm. turns, sorry. Then yeah. it will do like those flip, which I will implement. But if it's like far, then it will just straight away go to that page. Uh -huh. So user don't have to do it. But of course, there's an option that user can change. So if they want to continuously flip, then they can as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any question? Yes. Yeah. So that will be my next version. <laughs> yeah. I will add annotations and <laughs> highlighting and searching, basically just to make the book more usable. And yeah, that will be my next, my next steps. Any other questions? Suggestions, maybe? <laughs> okay. well, thank you very much.